Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are welcoming back Colleen Rowley, former FBI agent and whistleblower, and back in 2002, one of the uh, Time Magazine People of the Year for whistleblowing, a long time, wonderful peace advocate, justice advocate, activist of all sorts, and participant in the upcoming flotilla to Gaza to bring aid to the people of Gaza. Colleen Rowley, welcome to Talk World Radio. Well, thank you for having me. So we had Anne Wright on about this upcoming flotilla. So many wonderful and courageous people are going. Uh, Why did you decide to go and what are you expecting at this point? Well, I don't think there's any other alternative to um, really trying harder. Um, I've been telling people, you know, as much as we've been doing all these years and, you know, when when you contacted me, I said, boy, have we been at this a long time. Uh, I sent you the photo of all of the banners we we lined up across our footbridges going. That was in 2007, 2008. I look in my garage and I still got from, you know, almost 20 years ago, things that I've saved. So it's been a long time and the situation just seems to get worse and more dangerous, especially traumatic even for people to be watching a genocide unfolding. You know, we, we, we read about those things in history books and, uh, you know, of course, the Nazi Holocaust and Pol Pot and the Armenian genocide. I didn't think we would actually end up having to really witness and watch it in live time like this. And, you know, one of the reasons I said yes right away is in the first few months, even I started seeing the faces of my own children and grandchildren in the faces of the poor Gazans uh, children, babies and children being murdered, orphaned, starved. I mean, I can't watch those things. Um, you know, I know <laughs> Our, one of our colleagues, Craig Murray, said, you know, he used to just cry watching him. And he goes, what's happening to me after six months? I've almost kind of stopped crying because I'm becoming desensitized to the killing of children. I mean, it's it's hard to even understand this. So anyways, two weeks after uh, after October 8th, I painted banners and did the same thing. We went up on a footbridge, uh, uh, stop the genocide on one side and cease fire on children on the other side. And, you know, it's, it's, we can feel like we can, we're doing something. So it's like, at least you, you can kind of ostrich yourself, but it's just not enough. And now as you see regional war already at a low level, but threatening to turn into full level. And I'm, I'm with the vet intelligence professionals for sanity who's warning that this is this is very likely to turn into world war three and with world war three which is very as you well know the only thing that's different about world war three as einstein said and and we all i think some of us recognize at least the thing that's different between the horrors of world war one and world war two is now we have thousands of nuclear warheads all aimed at each other um, and uh, we've 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 uh, shredded all of the nuclear treaties that were supposed to keep these restrained and and, and from happening. We were we were kind of uh, complacent for a long time, thinking all of these treaties after Gorbachev and uh, and Bush uh, and even Reagan to some extent worked this out. We thought, okay, it's that Cold War is behind us. Well, it's come back with a vengeance. We've torn up the treaties. And now we have the flashpoints. You know, I I was actually surprised that the genocide going on in Gaza would now turn into the first flashpoint. A lot of us thought Ukraine. Ukraine was really likely to turn into the flashpoint, especially when Macron and France uh, threatened to send troops over to be a a tripwire. I mean, you can't you can hardly say these things without cringing because it is so bad. It's it's like some stuff we used to read in books. But anyways, now um, I don't think we have an alternative. And so this this flotilla uh, to Gaza is really um, 
and it's an excellent idea. It's really quite the opposite of uh, the the whole forces that, it, as you know better than anybody else, the war is a lie and all of the deceit and all of the ginning up of emotional fear, hate, greed, all of these things that go into creating war. Well, think about it. A flotilla of, of trying to bring food and humanitarian uh, uh, supplies and medicine, even anesthesia, uh, which they apparently don't have, and they're amputating children's legs and arms without anesthesia. If you think about it, this is really an excellent, excellent uh, counter counter to what is ginning up war. Not to say that you know that the, it's risky and the chances of things actually working to have their intended effect are very you know dubious given the situation. But you know what? I've been telling people, and a lot of people are saying, "Why are you doing this?" And I've been saying, "Well, you know what? There's a chance that this can have an effect." Um, they've been doing this for a long time, trying to sell supplies and humanitarian. Uh, food and things into Gaza, and even though they only it only worked the first couple times that they got stuff in, you know the timing right now might. There's a lot of things happening. All the developments with the uh, Israel overreacting and shooting aid workers, and and even some of my politi our politicians here in Minnesota, which we were were con were contacting ahead of time, uh, because you know in case we something happens bad on this flotilla. And in case we get kidnapped, as this happened before, we wanted our local Congress people um, to know about it so that they, in theory, <laughs> they're supposed to try to help us, whatever. So I've been contacting them. And you know, when, they, when they're putting out statements now, even though many of them are pro-Israel and took money from APAC and they, they voted for war funding, they're really now almost forced to say that, well, I agree with you for aid to Gaza. In fact, I was actually I'm a little surprised, but I can see why they have to say that politically. So you know what? Maybe, maybe the timing is pretty good right now when you even get people who voted for this and who, who may well vote for it tomorrow to give more uh, billions to Israel, but they still are forced to say that they are not against humanitarian aid to Gaza. So, right. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why I think that, that this is something definitely worth attempting. I couldn't agree more. And I think it's a wonderful and, and inspiring and courageous thing that you all are doing. Uh, if you succeed, I think a lot of other people and organizations and nations are going to want to start sending aid into Gaza on boats. Why not? If one group can do it, if you fail, and I certainly hope you do not, uh, it, 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 it means outrage by these people, the very same people who support sending all the weapons and couldn't care less about slaughtering people in Gaza. They are opposed to attacking people bringing aid to the same people they are genociding. Uh, so it means it means another level of outrage, I hope. That, that's right. Um, of course, I'm pretty cynical. <laughs> you probably have noticed before, I've, I've got a certain amount of cynicism and I was a, a media person. I have a lot in my background that, you know, never came out in the Time uh, Magazine article, but my background, I actually was a media spokesperson for seven years in, in some of these big, crime cases in Minnesota. So I have a little understanding of media. And one of the things that, of course, we all talked about was if it bleeds, it leads. That was always the, 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 the uh, not the mantra, but the general recognition. And so what you were, so in a way, even if it doesn't work out, let's say something bad does happen, God forbid, um, you know what, maybe that will finally prompt, finally, after all this time, prompt some of the mainstream media to be forced to cover the story. Um, our, our, our Minneapolis Star Tribune paper, there is one really good reporter and he was wanting to write up a story already about this. Um, but of course, his bosses nixed it. And, you know, they, they, they say, well, you know what, just because 
there are some gutsy Americans. In fact, they don't call us gutsy. They probably call us stupid. Uh, stupid Americans who think they can, can sail into Gaza. That doesn't make it newsworthy. But if something happens, then maybe they can cover it. And, you know, that, that's unfortunately, that's, again, it's my cynicism, but it's also the reality of how our mainstream media works. So at the very least, I think there is a chance uh, that, and, and really what I'm trying to say is educating Americans about the threat to themselves. Because as, you know, the genocide was, uh, uh, did cause more people because it was, you know, it's why they want to shut down TikTok. It's why they want to shut down, uh, you know, censor a lot of the social media because people could see it. And so, yes, it did resonate and act like it, you know, traumatized some of us to watch it. So, yes, that was already the case. But I don't think when people realize that this actually now as regional war is breaking out, that the costs of the war will be coming back, will be boomeranging back and hitting themselves. You know, we've talked about this many times. You and I have talked about it with the boomerang blowback from the domestic violence in this country and the mass shooters that are inspired and the culture of militarization is really, um, you, you always are very cautious and say, well, there's a big correlation <laughs> and whether it's a causation or not. And but the, but I honestly think I mean, I think it is a causation that we are watching all of this escalating violence. It's one of the blowbacks. But people don't understand that some of those costs to themselves are actually um, what they're doing abroad. And they just think, oh, well, you know, people are dying in, in uh, Ukraine and Gaza, but that's far away. So, again, this is something that with our action, I think we bring it home. And I think that it's one of those things we try to educate people that the, if you do not, if you don't stop the genocide or curtail it, it, it will morph into regional war. It already is at a low level of regional war. And it's threatening to go into full regional war, depending on if they can stop Israel from from uh, whatever you want to call it, it's retaliation or, I mean, it's, that's not even, what would you call it? <laughs> What's the term for what Israel's contemplating doing now? It's not legal at all, but you know, they're ratcheting, they're ratcheting it up. They want this more of a big war. Netanyahu and the others want it. Why? To take the, to take the focus and to take their criticism from the, from the ongoing genocide. So they're ratcheting up this this uh, really terrible regional war, yeah. and I again I think that if we can educate people in time, the big question is in time about the cost to themselves and how this is all boomeranging back. I I'm a little hopeful because I do see more people talking about it, and uh, you know our veteran intelligence professionals did put out a warning about. Uh, the looming, uh, you know, nuclear war, World War III nuclear war. We were we were actually focused more on Ukraine because it was about three weeks ago, but now it looks like it's more likely to happen in the Mideast. I'm afraid so. And I think it's an excuse also to keep getting more weapons for the genocide under the banner of getting them for something else. And I, I think, Colleen, I've struggled for years to get any corporate media outlet to touch the topic that mass shooters are disproportionately veterans of these wars, which is not a correlation, it's a direct causation, uh, and they won't touch it. Um, but my concern is, is the blowback, not just in those terms, but in terms of World War III, which we started out talking about, it seems, tell me if I'm wrong, it seems that a lot of people in the US government don't want World War III, don't want nuclear apocalypse, but want to do everything that makes it more likely. Want to expand NATO even if it leads to a war with Russia. And once it does, the answer is more expansion of NATO. And if Macron is a Frankenstein out of control, so be it. If, if Netanyahu starts war after war, give him more weapons, give him more weapons. And if he's out of control and starts World War III, so be it. I, I mean, aren't they just playing with fire aren't they just making it more and more likely even if they don't want it 
Yeah. Uh, you know, this strategic global uh, chess board strategy. And again, a lot of these people don't really have a clue about any of the costs of war, the, the half a million Ukrainians that have died, the, the, the you know, they, they really are, think they're playing a global chess game for, you know, to, for the United States to, to have this full uh, unipolar dominance, uh, unipolar, superpolar, uh, super uh, power. Um, and this has been going on for a long time, but it's a game. And they don't really, a lot of them don't even listen. By the way, if there is a smart, intelligent, wise person that happens by luck to be in the CIA or happens to be in the, you know, chiefs of uh, the Pentagon or whatever, half the time they don't even listen to those people because they're in la-la land. And uh, a good example is, uh, uh, I know Ray McGovern has brought this up a couple of times, and I remember being struck by it. There were some there was some hard questioning of Biden along the lines of what you just said, you know, why are you doing these things to make things more dangerous to, you know, etc to make things worse. And he was being questioned and challenged by one of the national news reporters on a TV interview. And you know what his answer was? Ha, huh, I can't believe you're asking me this. We're the United States of America. That's as that's as thinking as you get uh, with. And it's not just Biden. It's a lot of people. This this notion of superiority. And we've seen this throughout history where where a group of people think God is on their side. And, you know, obviously that that kind of defines Israel, but it has defined other uh, other countries and other groups throughout history. When you're in this thing, the pride is just blinding you. And you really can't even see. Uh, so you, you're, you're thinking you're a strategic chess player that you can operate proxies and the, the proxy terrorist forces around the world. They'll never turn against you. You know, they cut the last the last chapter of Charlie Wilson's war out of the movie. So you watch Charlie Wilson's war movie and it goes up to where he, Charlie Wilson gets the award for winning uh, the war in Afghanistan in Afghanistan to, to, to against the Russians. He gets the award. That's the end of the movie. There's a whole last chapter to that movie where it shows 9-11 because the people we were using and, you know, as our proxy forces, and this hasn't stopped. It just continues. Now there's ISIS and the neo-Nazis in Ukraine and, uh, and the Kurds and the uh, Mech in uh, Iran, I think the Baluchi, I, I, I keep seeing these things. I went, oh my gosh, it just never ends. We're using these, these uh, um, people. And of course, a lot of people are, you know, have gr legitimate gripes against their government, but we incite them and we always pick the most radical, ruthless groups to be our, our forces. Anyways, we've been doing this for a long time. It's almost never, it's always n never worked. And it's always had this this terrible blowback. And yet nothing is ever learned. You know, even my points about 9-11, I kind of feel like I have survivor's guilt <laughs> in some way because 9-11 started this all. And, you know, a bunch of us knew what, you know, at the time that there were terrorists and, you know, not just I barely knew the CIA really knew. But we did know some of the parts of it ahead of time. And yet we, nothing was done and people stalled and everything. So you start to say, oh, my gosh, you know, if you if I only could have done more, um, maybe 9-11 would have not become the new Pearl Harbor pretext. And maybe we wouldn't have gone down these last 22 years and be at the be at the verge, the eve of uh, of nuclear. I mean, in World War Three, nuclear war, maybe maybe something could have stopped it. I do feel, I don't feel like guilty, but I think it is a form of survivor's guilt. And, you know, it's, it's again, it's just like they never learn and they never, they never do a, 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 an analysis afterwards. They just continue on. It's, it's Obama's favorite thing. Well, we can never look back. He, he said this out loud and oh, yeah. what he said defines all of this horrible foreign policy, what I call a fool's errand. It's a fool's errand 
of not to, okay, let's share some power. Why can't we share some power? No, we have to be the unipolar. Uh, one of my friends who was a former military says that he saw a paper that went across his desk that said any country that um, threatens to even uh, impact our decision making is an enemy. That's how much it, it is. You know, we have to be so powerful on the top that any place that would even threaten to challenge our decision making has to be, you know, we have to attack them or whatever. And so you wonder why we have this, but it's always like, oh, we can't look back. Oh, yeah, that was a Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, I don't know, uh, 9-11. These were all mistakes, but don't look back. Don't look back. Continue on. But and, it seems and you, to me, Colleen. You know what this is? This is Pete. This is Pete Seeger's song, Waste Deep in the Big Money. That uh, one time I had a chance, uh, Pete Seeger got a, uh, he was still alive, but he got sick. And so his grandson, Tao Seeger, stood in for him. And he sang, that was the first time I'd heard the song, Waste Deep in the Big Muddy. But it's a perfect metaphor. You're, you're knee deep in, the, in drowning, then you're, you're waist deep, and finally you're neck deep. And, and only this one smart person says, we got to turn around. Oh, my gosh. This is a point where... We are neck deep. I think at this point, our, our leaders might be go, their bodies might be going floating by and we are neck deep in the big muddy. Colleen Rowley, we got about five minutes left. I think that even before 9-11, George W. Bush campaigned for president saying he wanted to attack Iraq. They had the plans within hours. The Patriot Act was already written. One of When we try to encourage peace activists, you know, we say, look, we stopped this base. We stopped this weapons shipment. We stopped this carpet bombing of Syria. One of the things we say is we've stopped an urgent need for a war on Iran here, 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 five times, you know, and they never yeah. mentioned it, but they keep pushing for a war on Iran. Uh, you know, so I, 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 and, you know, when they finally get it, it won't be simply because of the pretext that was used that minute. They've been trying to get a war on Iran for 30 years, you know, so I would take a little bit of the guilt off of you and put it on <laughs> George W. Bush and Dick Cheney. Well, I got two comments about that. Um, one is perseverance is one of the virtue traits that people think of as a virtue tra uh, trait of leadership, right? Perseverance. We got to persevere. If you read The Wisdom of Psychopathy, <laughs> by Wisdom of Psychopaths by uh, Kevin Dutton, you're going to find that perseverance is actually a very much a psychopathic trait. Most honest, decent people, if they try something once or twice, they give up. Uh, you know, I tried to run for Congress once. It was really pretty eye-opening, uh, horrible thing. It was a march into hell. And you know what? I never tried again. I don't have that psychopathic quality that I can just, but a lot of uh, politicians actually, you, don't be surprised if George Santos isn't trying again, to be honest. So that's, so that's one thing. They never give up and they keep uh, bringing these pretexts. You're right. They're just opportunistic pretexts that they use. And it's unfortunate they, that they work. But, um, you know, back in 2007 was a really close call with uh, Cheney, apparently, was trying to do this secretly and launch war. Oh, yeah. And back then I painted, I don't even know, 20, 30 of these don't bomb Iran orange banners. And I called it the orange alert to kind of play off the, uh, the, the color codes at the time. And yeah. we went up on the footbridges and you're right, you know, maybe something the universe aligned and we were able at that time. <laughs> yeah. Don't Iraq Iran. I had that on there. Yep. I have, I have Iraq and then I have the Q turning to an N. Yeah. Um, so exactly. And, um, you know, the thing is very sad that here we are all over again. I have the I kept the banners in the garage. And so now I'm telling people, you know, if this continues to ratchet up while I'm on the flotilla, come up, come get them all. 
take them out there and at least you can you can try to do something you know people are driving by they have they can glance up it's a free billboard it's a free you know i called it at some time the uh what did i call it the blogging the highway blogging i think i called yeah, it yeah. but free you know it's, it's something yeah. we can do but yeah they just don't ever give up and they they they're so incensed with this and also they are neck deep. So a lot of them, when they're that deep in, into it, it's kind of like Curtis LeMay. They don't think there's any way they can go back. So it's a, it's a difficult challenge for us right now. And we're going to have to just use our, as you always say, creative nonviolence. And sometimes we, this is going to really require a lot of creativity to try to thwart what's going on right now. Colleen Rowley, we've got just about one minute left. How can people follow what's happening with the flotilla and what's happening with you and how can people help? Well, there's two websites. One I think is called the um, International Gaza Flotilla. The other one is more the US and it's called US Boats to Gaza. Uh, there are donate buttons on both of those sites that will help. And it's not just for this first emergency sailing, but they intend to go again in the summer. Um, so they, again, this is an edge, it's, it's, it's doing a lot of things, but one of the things it's doing is education, as well as, of course, this attempt. And it all depends on what happens. But so that's something. And I'm hoping that our, our groups here, Women Against Military Madness, Veterans for Peace, um, and other, other sites will publish and certainly, obviously, if something happens, it should be pretty. I'm going to take a picture of us getting onto the boat if it's not sabotaged already in port and, and send it to my husband, you know, for starters. And then he's going to try to get it out to other people. And so people can follow this. And I, I would just say it's, in, it's incredibly necessary for uh, more attention and focus on this. That will help. Uh, it will help increase the chances of the success of the mission to actually even get into Gaza if there's more media attention and pressure. And of course, it might help actually save our lives if there's more media attention. So that's what people can do. Right on. So please send me anything you can as long as you're able. Colleen Rowley and everybody listening and watching, please share this everywhere. And we will have links up to those websites at Talk World Radio. Org. Colleen, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Yeah, thank you again for all your work. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at Talk World Radio. Org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.